My name is Fernando Costa. I serve as an assistant city manager for the city of Fort Worth, and it's my pleasure on behalf of David Cook, our city manager, to welcome you this evening to this forum with candidates for the newly created position of diversity and inclusion director. And we're happy to have with us uh, this evening several city council members led by our esteemed mayor, Betsy Price, and several members of the task force on race and culture who had recommended to the city council that we create this position to lead a new department, a diversity and inclusion department in the city of Fort Worth. The task force made this recommendation because they wanted to elevate the importance of diversity, inclusion, and equity and access as a function of city government in view of many disparities that the task force had identified in the way that residents of Fort Worth experience the qual or quality of life. Disparities pertaining to everything from criminal justice to economic development, education, governance, health, housing, and transportation. Therefore, this position will play an important role in helping the city manager and the city council to make sound decisions about the equity delivery of city services and the equity investment of city resources in infrastructure across the community. We had more than 300 candidates expressing interest in this position from around the country. Candidates representing all kinds of diverse backgrounds. And we are confident that we have found the six best candidates, the six candidates who are best suited this job. They have come here to Fort Worth this week. We spent all day with them in various exercises. This evening, of course, we'll have the opportunity for the public to meet all six of these candidates. We'll have a panel of four race and culture coach, task force co-chairs posing some individualized questions based on the backgrounds of these candidates. And then we'll provide equal time for members of the public who are here this evening to pose unfiltered questions uh, to the candidates so that you get answers directly uh, from them. Afterwards, we'll have additional time for the candidates to mingle informally with members of the public who are here tonight. We have based these, this whole format upon suggestions we've received from many of you who are here tonight. You've told us you wanted to have direct access to the candidates. You've told us you wanted to ask questions directly to them, and we want to uh, facilitate that kind of interaction. Our consultant to the Task Force on Race and Culture uh, and a good friend of Fort Worth is Mr. Uh, Estrus Tucker, who has done racial justice work around the country and around the world. But his hometown is Fort Worth, Texas. This is his priority. We're very blessed to have Estrus Tucker in our community. He will serve as our moderator this evening. And therefore, I call your attention to Estrus Tucker. Ah. <laughs> Thank you, Fernando. And I am going to have to be very, very careful because I tend to move and I have a very narrow space to move up here, so if I lose my train of thought, it's because I've gone too close to the edge. Um, but this is a, an incredible evening with some incredible people, and it's my great honor to introduce um, our candidates. And you have uh, bios, uh, each of you, pick them up. And I'm just going to ask them to, to stand. Um, so you can see them again, and you'll certainly be hearing from them. And then I'll introduce our panelists and uh, go over a few basic procedures to maximize the space and time for your voices, for your questions, uh, and then hand it over to, to our uh, panelists. Our former co-chairs uh, is the appropriate title they've been encouraging us to use. <laughs> uh, so to my immediate left, Christina Brooks. Next to Christina, Stephen Francis. 
Next to Steven Stancia Jenkins. Next to Stancia, Michonne Landry. Next to Michonne, Shawnee Barracks Moore. Next to Shawnee, Ty Stimson. Uh, so to the candidates, I believe it'll get better, but when you start off with applause, you know, um, that's a good sign. <laughs> and of course, our panelists will be our former co-chairs of the Race and Culture Task Force. To my immediate left, Rabbi Andrew Bloom. Rosa Navajar. Bob Ray Sanders. And Lily Biggins. And I believe this is going somewhere on your 14th year in serving. Not exactly. So I want to lift up uh, just some basic guidelines. Um, we've asked that you sign up to ask a question during tonight's forum. Uh, we've allocated an equal amount of time. So the audience, the community questions, will, get, will have 45 minutes for all of those questions. And in order for us to allow as many residents as possible to participate, we have the following real simple guidelines. Um, I'll moderate. I'll do my best without falling off the stage to keep us within the time parameters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Each person is limited uh, to one question from the audience. And you can direct your question to one candidate or allow me to, to, to direct. And I'm encouraging uh, the questions to be uh, to all as much as you can, but not restricting. The candidate will then have up to two minutes to respond. And if you have additional questions, and we have some staff. Staff, if you'd kind of raise your hand, please get the staff's attention. If you have additional questions, and we'll add you to the list. We'll allow each person to ask one question until all of the people on the list have had their turn or we have run out of time. Please keep your questions brief so that the candidate will have more time to respond. So if your question needs a introduction, a context, a framing, that's, that's too long a question. <laughs> so, and I'll try to gently kind of keep you guided toward a good, succinct question so we can get as much feedback from these outstanding candidates as we can. Um, and then last, also audience members will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, during the informal meet the candidates after all the questions are complete. Um, and we will call upon people based upon the order that you signed up. And now I'll turn it to the former co-chairs of the Race and Culture Task Force. Estrus, thank you. Um, this question is going to be for all the candidates. And as Estra said, you'll have two to three minutes to answer each question. But um, please introduce yourself to, and tell the audience why you are the right fit for the diversity and inclusion director role for the city of Fort Worth. Christina, can you start with you, please? Good evening, Fort Worth. Oh, now. Let's try that again. Good evening, Fort Worth. Good evening. My name is Christina Brooks. I'm currently the Diversity and Inclusion Officer with the City of South Bend. And I've been shaped by Texas. I left here uh, as a high school graduate from San Antonio and went to Notre Dame on a full academic scholarship. And uh, some of you, that was about 1988, your football fans, you'll remember that was last year Notre Dame won their national championship in football. Uh, that was due in large part to my presence on campus as a freshman. Um, very true story, I was an academic tutor for the varsity uh, athletics and varsity football team, so I have no problem taking credit for that national championship season. But I've been shaped by America as well. I was born to two parents who came from the deep Jim Crow South. My mother was born to 
an Afro-Cuban who was disabled. And his wife, my grandmother, died when she was 24 from a very curable disease because of an unequitable healthcare system. My father was born to a very beautiful dark-skinned black woman and a white man whose identity has been shielded uh, from, from our family. So I was raised with an idea of what it means to be underrepresented and to be voiceless. And over the last 20 years of my career, I have made it a point to fight for the underrepresented and the voiceless in every capacity that I've held, whether that was in K through 12 education, post-secondary and higher education, in corporate America, in higher, uh, in nonprofit, and now in municipal government. The last two positions I've held, I created the office. The current office that uh, has been created, it started out as an office of one with no budget. Again, I'm going to remind you, you have three minutes to answer. Okay. And so I've been able to complete a citywide diversity and inclusion plan, 63 items, under budget and on schedule. And this would be coming home to me. I have family here in this area in Fort Worth, two that work for the city of Fort Worth. And I believe this is a, the right time for me to come home and help the city heal. Thanks for the question, Co-Chair Navaha. Uh, I would uh, like to just introduce myself as a, a lawyer, a public servant, and a diversity professional who has nearly 35 years experience uh, being uh, a, a diversity pr practitioner and attorney dealing with uh, civil rights, ADA, FMLA, um, Title VII type of, of law, uh, employment and labor law. And I'm a, a family man with two children, a wife, uh, who believes in listening. Uh, my mother told me that you never learn anything when you're talking. And so I've developed a good uh, habit of listening to folks mostly that are older than me because you don't get old being a fool, right? And so that's the first thing that I want to do when I get this opportunity is to listen to what the issues are and the concerns are of the community. I think I would be uniquely suited for the, the role because of my legal background to handle uh, the, the enforcement and investigatory issues that the Human Relations Unit currently has to, all, uh, to deal with. And uh, kudos to the city for elevating it to a department level of diversity and inclusion. But I was going through the 22 or so recommendations of the uh, Race and Culture Task Force, and I discovered that in my role as Chief Diversity Officer for the City of Columbus, I've basically touched on each one of these issues. Civilian oversight for police. We helped develop the police and fire cadet program. Uh, I did a 10-year plan to double diversity for police and fire, so that deals with diversity within the police department. Job training, apprenticeship program, transportations to jobs. Uh, we've done that, trying to recruit more diverse police officers, firefighters, and construction trades workers. Early childhood education. We have an aggressive pre-K uh, early start program in Columbus service learning and engagement with city year, education and incentives to achieve wage parity, capacity building for minority-owned businesses. I've been dealing with minority business enterprises ever since I started my career uh, when I wrote affirmative action legislation for the, the state of Ohio uh, for minority business set-asides for the state. Uh, Independent Citizen Restrict a Redistricting Commission Columbus is one of the biggest cities without a ward or district election process, so we've been working on that. Uh, diversity training, I've, I've dealt with implementing citywide implicit bias training. Uh, there's all kinds of things on this list that I think I can Mr. add Prince, value to. We'll need a, okay, a day. 
so that's why I think I'm well suited for the position. Now, just to clarify, the bell rings that I still have. How many seconds left? So when the bell rings, it's over. I thought, I thought that was a warning bell. I'm sorry. Good evening, uh, Stancia Jenkinson. Thank you so much um, for welcoming you to your city um, for this very important position. Um, and it, really, this particular position, if I think about being a, di I've been a DNI practitioner, I've done some level of diversity and inclusion work for the past 17 years. Really, the most impactful professional experience I had throughout my career is my 10 years that I spent in municipal government. I ent in the city of Kansas City, Missouri. I entered as a legislative aide and um, actually staffed uh, the chair of the planning and zoning committee and then went on and worked in the city manager's uh, communications office. And it was there that I learned the power of relationship and bridge building. I learned about the power of coalition building to bear upon a problem. And also, unfortunately, learned how institutionalized processes, policies, procedures can have an adverse impact on the very community that an organization is set there to serve. Um, that lit a, a passion in me, and um, I continued my work and I went on and did community relations work for an urban serving university. One, two, um, that I joined at a time where the relationship um, that they had with diverse communities or those that they were there to serve was not representative if you were to step on campus. It wasn't representative in the employees, the access and services that we provided to the community um, that it resided in, um, or to students either. So for me, taking on this role would be a perfect combination of using my skill set in diversity and inclusion. We've also instituted programming within the University of Nebraska system across the four campuses. We have about 14,000 employees. Um, and then we have uh, students, faculty, and staff as well to learn um, to have DNI diversity development and training so that we can create a more inclusive environment. So that DNI practitioner experience, coupled with the community relations, relationship building, uh, partnership building, as well as my experience in municipal government and understanding uh, system and policy and how to interrupt some of those things, I think would make me a uniquely qualified candidate for this position. Good evening. My name is Michonne Landry, and I am a resident of Fort Worth. I was born here. I attended Carroll Peak Elementary. I attended Alice Carlson. I attended Morningside Middle School, and I graduated from Arlington Heights High School. Very diverse, obviously, on both sides of the coin in terms of the schools and the systems. Um, here I advocate on a day-to-day -day basis for equity. I have my own business and so I do strategic planning and resources and training for individuals and organizations that want to build an inclusive and diverse environment. And here in the city, uh, I have advocated from the standpoint of working with the Tarrant County Food Policy Council. I've sat on that council most recently sitting on the Tarrant County Disproportionality Council, um, working with Leadership ISD to advocate for equity in schools. Um, and so I have been in diversity and inclusion for quite some time now. Um, as a small woman-owned business, obviously supplier diversity and economic development has been important to me and leveraging um, capacity building for small women-owned businesses and diverse businesses. And from a city of Fort Worth standpoint, it's my city. 
I want to make it better. I want to make it more diverse. I want to make it more inclusive. I want to make it more welcoming and more equitable for everyone. My name is Shani Barracks Moore. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. And I have been a social justice and diversity and inclusion practitioner um, for about 20 years. I've often said that this is what I was born to do as I'm the daughter of an immigrant uh, that came to this country um, after being orphaned and you know just saw the opportunity in uh, coming to the, uh, to the US to try to attain a better life um, that she didn't have um, in her native home country of uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I got my start uh, as a social justice practitioner doing community-based uh, racial justice work with uh, the YWCA Triangle Racial Justice Initiative where I learned the power of dialogue in bridge building, the power of just speaking to each other and listening to each other and the power of perspective taking and just really immersing yourself in cultural humility, which really has more to do with learning more about you and your perspectives uh, and how those perspectives and experiences really can relate to building bridges with others. I was brought to Fort Worth in 2012 uh, where I served as the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Tarrant County College District under the leadership of the late, great Irma Johnson Hadley, who really has probably been one of the most influential uh, examples in my life of what it means uh, to do what uh, Cornell West has said, where justice is what love looks like in public. Uh, there at Tarrant County College District, I created the uh, Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion, where I created a a, a, a strategic plan for diversity and inclusion based upon a climate survey. And I'm just a change agent, so I really want to really use that change agency to build a city of change agents in the city of Fort Worth, where all of us feel a call to action and feel as if the work that we can do for the city will matter. So uh, together that we are able to facilitate healing for the city of Fort Worth. Good evening. Um, why I believe I'm a good fit for this role as a director, uh, a diversity and inclusion director, is this, this is home. This is where I go home every evening. This is where I, I raise my son with my wife, and this is where I'm going to be before and after this position. I think being an attorney um, here as a prosecutor, every day I try to seek justice, not only for victims, but also for our community. And over the past few years, I have been in our communities working, serving as the criminal justice chair of the Race and Culture Task Force, making recommendations for civilian oversight of the police department. And you know, there's many of you out here today in the audience that I've worked alongside arm in arm and hand in hand to try to make Fort Worth the best place possible for not only you and I, but for the, for the generations to come after us. Um, and in this role as the director of the diversity and inclusion um, department, not only would I continue to do what I've been doing, which is working, but I would try to advance uh, minority communities and just to make our Fort Worth a more diverse and inclusive uh, city for, for everyone. And if that means implementing policies to uh, improve economic mobility for minority and women in business enterprises, and making sure that the, uh, we have an equitable delivery of municipal service, but just also restore Fort Worth to what we all have grown to know it as. This is, it's one community. Each one of us make up our own individual Fort Worth, but collectively this is one Fort Worth. And so, you know, our city is hurting right now and it's important for myself to use my, bring my time, my talents, and my treasures to the city of Fort Worth and give back to Fort Worth who has given me so much. And so um, I ask that, you know, whoever is ultimately selected that we advance Fort Worth and we embrace our differences, resolve our issues, and let's move forward together. As we go to the second uh, question, I just want to uh, make sure you know that there are some seats, or at least about 11 seats, right down front. Um, so, and, and a few in the middle as well, so please feel free to come down. We're not going to ask you a question if you come sit on this front. <laughs>
Uh, the next question. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for being here with us today. Uh, my question is to uh, Christina Brooks. And uh, the city of South Bend has been in the national spotlight this year uh, for the unfortunate events surrounding the loss of Eric Logan, who was a young black civilian in a violent encounter um, with a white male police officer. This event, along with the continued rise of violent crimes in the city, uh, has only deepened the racial divide and distrust between law enforcement and your minority community members of South Bend. As the diversity and inclusion leader, what are you doing to bridge that divide and repair the relations within the two communities? Thank you. Um, I first want to provide some context that uh, the, the issues that have been in the national spotlight um, with the city of South Bend did not start um, with the advent of Mayor Pete's campaign for the highest office in the land. These are long-standing entrenched issues in the community. And I don't think that the city of South Bend is any different from any other community across the country. One of the things that um, I've done since I started the position in May of 2016 was to build relationships with the police department and not just uh, the police chiefs, but with the officers themselves. And understanding the pain and the frustration that the community felt having voiced their concerns um, and seen several iterations, starts and stops of initiatives, um, reactionary initiatives that with an election of a new mayor or different council members, the attention turned from what the community had brought forward. And so when I started uh, working with the city of South Bend, I made it my business to try to not just look at uh, the residual effects of trauma, but to get to the root of the trauma and to understand um, and acknowledge the pain and the anguish of the community. And that started with developing interactions between police officers, beat officers, and specifically men of color in the community. And specifically men of color who were of high standing. Having them sit in the room and share their stories with each other. Men of color who had uh, <clears throat> been treated unfairly, and officers who were sharing their stories about what they faced every day, seeing dead babies and taking six-year-olds, nine-year-olds who had committed suicide in their closet. And when those stories were shared, they humanized the other. The officers became their neighbor, and the men of color became their neighbor. And so I'd like to do that here in South Bend, um, bringing those two communities together. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great answer. Yes, my, my question. First of all, thank you all for coming here to visit us and to be with us uh, in this important role. My question is for uh, Ms. Moore. Uh, you, uh, in your position now in uh, higher education at uh, UNT, you did a campus inclusion climate survey uh, of which the data was going to be used to create a strategic plan and recommendations for UNT. With all the um, incentives, incentives offered, the 
study only gain, uh, garnered 11.8% uh, participation of the faculty and the student body and administration responses. Do you feel that this 11.8% uh, participation rate is successful and can you build a program out of a small number if you see it as a small number like 11.8? Uh, like and if you don't see it as a success, just as importantly, what have you learned from it and what can you apply those lessons to, uh, moving forward? Lots of pieces to that question. Uh, so when we did, this was UNT's first ever campus inclusion climate survey, is this on? Uh, and it was a uh, effort where we used an existing tool. Uh, and we actually had the highest response rate of any university that used that tool. So it's very difficult uh, to get, as I saw even at Tarrant County College District, to get people to engage. Sometimes engagement is a challenge. Um, but I think part of the reason we had the highest response rate of any of the universities that had used the tool is because we promised folks that we were actually going to use the data. Um, now, I will say that, um, you know, sometimes when you ask a question that's going to yield very detailed answers, sometimes people don't want to hear the result, hear the real answer. Um, we are still analyzing the data. It has been a, a journey in... Um, sort of negotiating with um, administration to really take the opportunity to look at ourselves, who we are and who we're not. And one of the things that I've said is that if you are not practicing active and intentional inclusion and equity, then you are in effect practicing active and maybe unintentional passive exclusion. And so what, So what I would say is, um, in engaging in these efforts where you are demonstrating to folks that yes, your voice will be heard, and your disaggregated voices will be heard, so that it's the voices of color, it is the voices of African American males who are um, some of our, have the most difficulty graduating and matriculating. Uh, it is the voices of our Latinx students and our, and our DACA students that are often terrified uh, to even go to class every day because of the, the current climate. Um, so what I would say is it's a call to change agency, and it's also a call to say that if you raise your voice, we will hear you and make sure that it is not um, uh, diluted uh, within uh, the voices of others who um, may want to pretend there's nothing to see here. Sorry. <laughs> My question is for Ms. Jenkins. A majority of the experience with diversity inclusion programs has been within higher education of state universities, most recently at the University of Nebraska system that has a student body approximately of 52,000 students and over 5,000 faculty and staff. The city of Fort Worth has just been named the 13th largest city in the United States with a population of 895,000 people and growing and the, major, uh, the minority communities are growing at a fast rate as well. This, um, the major, uh, major hurdles that you anticipate facing in making this transition from higher education to much larger and more populous municipal setting, and how do you overcome that? Thank you for the question. Um, as far as scale, I think I would um, rely upon my experience and municipal government um, in Kansas City, Missouri with a population just under 500,000. Um, I know that um, scale will be an issue in addressing some of those diversity and inclusion issues and a lot of those practices. I think that um, with the ability to um, disaggregate, take a look at, move along some of those recommendations that have come out of the task force, particularly as it relates to training and development, um, building advocates also who can be utilized across the city and within the departments to drive some of that. We can make some real systemic change. It's about um, broadening and giving the people the tools and resources that they need in order to drive some of that. You're correct that 
um, a lot of the DNI training development has taken place in higher education, but really it cannot be a one-off. There has to be systems, policies in place, um, repetition of that, a setting of a climate that's inclusive, and a city government that's reflective, a police force that's reflective, uh, representation um, on boards and commissions connected with the city that are reflective so that you can make the change from the inside out and try to uh, move Fort Worth toward the type of inclusive community that um, the city wishes it could be. My question is for Mr. Stimson. And Ty, I'll warn you that this question is gonna be longer than your answer. Because <laughs> there are three or four questions in one, uh, and I hope you'll remember them as I go through it. You've had a decorated career as a prosecuting attorney for both Dallas and Tarrant counties, and were appointed as a criminal justice chair on the Fort Worth Racing Culture Task Force in 2017. These positions have not had a direct role specific to developing and implementing diversity and inclusion. So how do you feel these positions have prepared you to oversee all diversity and inclusion efforts for the city of Fort Worth? What challenges do you anticipate in making this transition from practicing law to building and implementing diversity and inclusion programs? And finally, do you feel that due to your service on the task force, that you will be identified as serving the city council's interests instead of the community's? That, that, that's, that's a very good question, and I hope I uh, unpack that and answer appropriately. Um, I think my background as an attorney, both in Dallas and Tarrant County, uh, has given me an understanding of how to approach legislations and how to uh, implement policy. I think with, within the diversity and inclusion uh, spectrum, I think Ultimately, I'm a human, and I and I want. I, I was raised by the golden rule: treat others as you would treat yourself. And so, um, you know, I knew going in, I didn't have the background as the other five candidates. So what I did is what I would do in, in the legal field. I reached out to subject matter experts and tried to soak in as much knowledge and expertise as I could, as I uh, to be prepared to take on this new responsibility. Uh, but I think also uh, I've, I've been connected to the people. I've been, um, if you look at the things, you know, everyone has my bio. I've done work in Southeast Fort Worth, Stop 6, Las Vegas Trail, Northside. There's not a part of Fort Worth that I don't spend my time trying to give back. And I'm sure my, my wife doesn't enjoy how much I'm not a, uh, at home because I'm out trying to make Fort Worth the best place for all. Um, regarding the question of whether or not uh, my role on the task force would just be um, um, I forget the exact language that you use, but basically um, being a, a voice for the city council, uh, I think that people didn't have the background experience of my, my role on the, as the criminal justice chair of the task force. It was uh, never a lot of pleasant conversations. It was um, pushback, but it was also productive conversations. And um, I went in as not as a role as a prosecutor, but as a citizen who who wants the best for Fort Worth. And although it wasn't a popular recommendation of coming up with a citizens review board, but I knew that's what my city wanted. I knew that's what the community wanted. So it was incumbent on me to put my name and, and my credibility online because I knew I wouldn't be able to look Dr. Bell in the eye if I didn't stand up for what was right and do what was right. And so that's, that's what all I'm about is speaking truth to power and, and trying to see, see justice, not for just myself, but for everyone that's involved. My question is for Mr. Francis. Uh, it's our, uh, Stephen Francis, it's, it's our understanding that you resigned as the City of Columbus Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer because the staff and budget were cut to a point that the strategic initiatives couldn't be supported or sustained. Was your resignation a forbearer to what will happen in Fort Worth if you do not receive the support you think is deserved? Previously, you were at Honda, where private sector oftentimes have significantly more money and more resources than public sector. If given this opportunity to develop and implement the diversity and inclusion strategic plan and initiatives in Fort Worth, how would you sustain these programs from this for this inaugural role and department on limited resources within the city budget? 
Thank you, Co-Chair Biggins, for that question. The experience I had in the city of Columbus was uh, rewarding. I had a blue sky, very similar to the role that's being asked for Fort Worth uh, to create a new department. I also similarly had to inherit an existing staff that did not have all the transferable skills over to pure DNI and E work. So there's a lot of similarities. They actually increased my budget to do a disparity study in the first year, uh, but that appropriation went away and I, I wound up having basically 90% of my budget going to staff or salary and the other 10% for everything else. And I understand from talking to uh, the staff that they're in a very similar situation here at the new Office of Diversity and Inclusion. They were very transparent with us. I would be challenged with budget constraints, but I've been told with confidence that I can go to the appointing authority, whether that's Mayor Betsy Price or City Manager David Cook or Fernando Costa or members of uh, the community to ask for the resources that we need. I'm a data driven person and I believe that you have to justify those budget appropriations and I'm used to doing that. I'm used to pulling rabbits out of the hat, uh, wine from water and so I believe I can do the same thing here. What you do is build bridges with other departments, leverage their resources, build infrastructure that will survive budget cuts so that people still have the responsibility and hopefully there'll be built-in appropriations to those FTEs to, to, to build a legacy of the, of the, that, that this work requires. But I will say this, diversity costs money. Just like every other key line item that an organization has to run to be successful. And until we equate diversity with value, we won't be successful. Thank you. Yes, my question is for Ms. Landry. Uh, you've sat on a diversity inclusion company board. You've uh, recently uh, contracted a short-term consulting projects. You've been actively involved in helping plan and develop recommendations of strategic plans, but haven't been held professionally accountable for lo the long-term impacts and effects of those plans and recommendations. How have you measured the return of investment in your previous diversity inclusion <coughs> efforts? And how would you measure success in this position? And could you tell us what are the differences or how you see the differences between consulting to a board and running a department uh, when it comes to, let's say, the same project? What, how would you attack it from both perspectives? I believe the first part of that was um, in regards to the accountability piece um, in terms of uh, ensuring that um, the City of Fort Worth and my work with the City of Fort Worth would be um, accountable. Is that correct? Did I hear that correct? Okay. Um, one of the things that I can say is um, as a business owner, um, number one, if your clients don't feel that there's value, then you don't have clients. And so I say that because I feel that it's important that whenever I'm tasked with bringing value to a client as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I want to make sure that I'm assessing what the client needs adequately. I'm helping to deliver on what they need, and I'm creating um, metrics and data so that they are able to see the return on investment themselves. Uh, the sex, second part of that was measuring, I'm sorry, it was a long. How, how do you, <laughs> <laughs> it, it were long for you, long for me to read right. it as well. <laughs> uh, the difference between uh, accountability as someone who's consulting and accountability of someone who is has the position that you are interviewing uh, for? 
Yeah, so accountability to me is accountability. Um, there is no uh, vacillation between the two. Um, I feel that as a person who is self-accountable, um, I think that that's key. And I feel that in this role, you have accountability to the public. You have accountability to the employees of the city. Um, so there is accountability there. And I feel that if I'm not able to deliver, if I'm not delivering on the things that I say that I um, set in place in terms of the goals, then there's that lack of accountability that is there. So, um, yeah. Uh, on these next questions, let me accelerate them uh, so that we make sure we reserve the full amount for the, for the community questions. Um, so let's see if we can get uh, a one minute uh, response. And I'll ask the uh, panel uh, <laughs> to, to cut your question, too, because some of your questions are two minutes. But if <laughs> let's see if we can, we can wrap it quicker. Okay, my question is for uh, Ms. Brooks. In the city of South Bend, you just completed a three-year uh, disparity study that talked about, uh, that concluded that there were systemic institutional barriers to women and minority entrepreneurs. Th um, the number of companies is only 15% and, um, in, throughout the city of South Bend. 12% of the companies were awarded contracts and bids. Tell us what specific goals that you have put in place to build capacity and build MWE business. Yeah, so first of all, the, the disparity study that was just completed in South Bend was a culmination of a 32-year-old promise. Um, the disparity study, uh, um, well, the MWBE ordinance in the city of South Bend had been written in 1987, and we never had a disparity study uh, that could actually hold anyone accountable for producing results. So for 32 years, the residents in South Bend repeatedly asked um, for results and were never given any. So it wasn't until we completed this disparity study that uh, we were able to do that. So with the completion of the disparity study, um, we've rewritten the law. We rewrote the ordinance with the recommendations out of the disparity study that level the playing field for minority and women businesses and contracting and procurement for the city of South Bend. The first of which is developing minority and women businesses through uh, a contract, a community benefit agreement with the top 10 employers. Uh, I, didn't hear a, I didn't hear a buzz. This is a question for Ms. Moore, uh, and this is shorter than my last one. Uh, <laughs> your entire career has been focused in the nonprofit and education sectors. Municipal government politics and culture are very different from those your previous positions and in industries. So tell us how your past experience has prepared you to handle these situations navigate politics and promote the city culture among populations ranging from police and fire departments to impassioned and or upset community activists to the field employees at the city of Fort Worth. Okay, I'll be brief. Higher education is a whole lot of politics. Um, so we'll start there. <laughs> that uh, yes, there, there are lots of politics in city government, but you have constituents, you have customers, you have faculty who often sometimes may think they're higher than the law. Um, and um, the, some of the parallels are that we have actually trained, in several of my roles, I've actually trained police officers. Um, starting out with uh, the work that I did with the YWCA, we uh, created some connections in uh, Raleigh with the police department. We trained uh, police officers at uh, UNT and in the city of Denton, and it was bias-based training so that we are making everyone aware of the fact that we all have biases. If we're human, we have biases, and it may affect the way that we are doing our jobs, whether it's teaching or governing or policing.
This question is for Ms. Jenkins. Uh, uh, today, Nebraska is 10.5% Hispanic or Latino, according to the Census Bureau. That percentage has doubled since 2000, tw uh, since, uh, yeah, since 2000. Immigrants and other minorities represent the bulk of the state's current population. One of the main challenges they face is finding ways to communicate the opposition of anti-immigrant policies to both federal administration and local elected officials. As a community leader in diversity and inclusion, what measures have you taken to develop a, me a message of inclusivity, dignity and respect, and to create strategies that make civic integration and re-engagement possible among all citizens of Omaha? Thank you for the question. We first started at home. As we all know, we know the current state of affairs on a national landscape as it relates to immigrants, as it relates specifically to our Latinx communities as well. So making sure that our faculty staff, students had a supportive and inclusive environment was important um, for us and that that message came for the, from the top. Um, the uh, then president was very forthright with signing on to other universities across the nation, um, expressing um, their lack of support uh, for the anti-immigration bills coming out federally as well. Uh, we also had a number of campus conversations where we invited both in the community, civic organizations, and organizations that served our diverse populations to have conversations about resources that were available to them and to have those restorative justice conversations. We also had to bring up a, had to enact a freedom of speech policy so that students, faculty, staff, whoever you might be, know, knew that anything that uh, would be done on campus that would be, that would create or go against the type of environment we wanted to create uh, would not be tolerated. My question is for uh, Ty. Uh, you know that there is uh, distrust uh, among the Fort Worth African American community with law enforcement. We also have issues with SB4 uh, with the Latino community that uh, came up. We have 287G with the uh, Tarrant County uh, sh uh, Sheriff's Department, all things that you know well from working as a, as a prosecutor. Could you tell us how you would go about bridging, um, or building bridges between the law enforcement and uh, the minority majority communities, specifically around these uh, these instances which I just, which we just mentioned, uh, because we know that they're very important to the entirety of the community. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's important for us to allow our community a seat at the table before we implement policies and procedures, rather than rolling out policy and then having the community accept it for what it is. Let's invite the community at the table at the beginning of the process so you can, uh, <laughs> So you can de develop allies and develop buy-in before we roll it out to the city. And I think, you know, right now there's, a, there's this obvious distrust between law enforcement and our community, but it's important for us to figure out a way to, to let the police department know we support them, but also hear the concerns of the community that, that don't, they don't feel safe and they don't feel trust. So we need to work that out. And I think we just all need to come to the table and just have that family conversation and just let all the, you know, all, let, let it, everything out, but then know that once we leave this table, but we're going to move forward together. Mr. Francis, you worked at Honda uh, um, of America Manufacturing for over 20 years, and you inst uh, established a DNI strategic plan and implemented some of those initiatives. How does your previous experience translate from the private corporate sector to the municipal public sector? Thank you for the question. Uh, there's a lot of politics in corporate America as well. And we had to fight to establish a diversity committee structure. Honda across North America only had four company-wide committees. So we were able to uh, diplomatically elevate diversity committee as one of those five corporate-wide 
committees for the whole company. We also, the first order of business was for me to put diversity as part of the company-wide business plan. Uh, at Honda, they measure everything and they evaluate it quarterly. So if they evaluate and measure diversity progress, that's a good thing. And as you know, what gets measured gets done and what gets rewarded gets repeated. So we tried to build incentives in those goals and, and objectives so that people will be rewarded for their good work towards progressing diversity. One, one more, and then we'll transition to, to the community. Uh, this question is for uh, Slandry. While you've had success in your career, you like the higher education degrees that the rest of these candidates possess. How has your like of higher education affected your career path and do you feel like it's been a disadvantage to your ability to, to promote? So I feel that, um, first of all, I will say that um, part of that reason is because I have three children. One of those children has a disability and I chose to um, be a mom first uh, to my daughter and to take care of her in terms of her needs and what she needed. Uh, in terms of uh, not having uh, the degrees, I believe that one of the things that I feel quite honestly is that it's actually made me work twice as hard versus um, not hard enough or equally too. Um, so for me personally, you know, I think when I may be giving myself a six, someone else may be giving me an eight or a nine, you know. And so I think it's actually caused me to work a lot harder. But certainly I've seen um, disparities um, throughout my career. All right. Thank you. And now we'll begin with our community questions. And... Uh, your names are listed as you signed up, and so who's reading the names off? Say it again. Just call the number. So I've got to keep up with the numbers as I go through all of it. Okay. Right. Uh, let's begin with number one. <laughs> That's a good starting place, right? Uh, at two minutes and 30 seconds, you'll hear these. You know, you have, uh, this is to the question, two minutes. So at a minute and 30 seconds to hear bail, you have 30 seconds for that. So please don't answer questions for two minutes. Um, so question number one. Is the mic on? And ask the number two and three, come on up so we don't lose any time there as well. Go ahead. Reverend Joey Daniel Rattan, a uh, resident here in Fort Worth, Texas since 1999, since I was 19. Uh, I uh, thought I was going to ask Paul Bray Sanders the question, but hey, I'll ask him again. You're close to the mic. Put your mouth on the mic. That's some coaches in here. Uh, Mr. Ty uh, Stenson. Before Police Chief uh, Fisker uh, was fired in May, how many white officers did uh, he have uh, to discipline regarding excessive force and uh, profile? You know, unfortunately, I don't. I don't have that information. Um, I, since I work for the DA's office, I'm not privy to the. I'll stop you right there. It was 50. Okay. okay. Nothing. Yep. Yep. Uh, doesn't so is that that's the question oh, yes. thank you uh, he didn't know the answer and he's a local so. thank, thank you next good evening me llamo norma garcia lopez as you see that this forum was even bilingual friendly for our immigrant community but i will say my name is norma garcia lopez um, you know the city of fort worth the popul we make the latino population makes up 36 percent of the city here in fort worth and I'll be honest and be more, more very frank, the, this candidate forum is not, does not represent diversity um, for me in my eyes. Um, 
The task force ignored the immigrant needs in this city. Some of the city council members did not protect immigrants from SB4, uh, also included Mayor Price. I want to know what experience do you have working with immigrants, with the Latino community? And this, this question uh, applies to everyone, and I will have to go home and translate for my parents after this. Thank you. Can, can I start? Uh, the City of Columbus has a New Americans initiative, and they have both the City of Columbus and Franklin County actively engaged in New American support resources, language translation services, both at the courthouse and at the other commercial institutions. Uh, Columbus has uh, the second largest Somalian population, uh, second only to Minneapolis, Minnesota. We've got a very high and burgeoning Hispanic and Latino population. So they've been very intentional about focusing on immigration. Our mayor did an executive uh, order related to sanctuary city support. He was very tightrope because he didn't want to lose the federal dollar support by claiming that it was a sanctuary city, but he did everything that he could short of that to affirm our support for immigrant issues. The City of South Bend implemented an ID program for immigrant communities, which allowed them to have access to city services and um, use their ID um, to gain access um, to, to things that everybody else um, in the city that would have a federally issued ID um, would have. And that's been a very successful program um, and ex expanded beyond the city of South Bend into neighboring cities. And we also um, are starting to work with uh, the University of Notre Dame uh, on immigrant entrepreneurship, keeping immigrants in the city um, by helping them build and start businesses because we know that's the largest growing group um, that can support a, a local economy. Uh, let me just say for the record, on the first day that this task force got together, when it was getting its mission statement and those things together, we... Thank you, you just took away 30 seconds. I just wanna say that we made sure that we did not say citizens, we said residents. That included everybody who lives in Fort Worth regardless of their status. Are we still being allowed to answer the questions? One more, then we'll go to this next question. Okay, and I was just gonna say that at uh, UNT, we have a DACA task force where we uh, created resources specifically for our students so that they knew where to go. We had a Knowing Your Rights forum for our students um, and even some employees um, who needed those resources. And also, we were the first university to use that Campus Inclusion Climate Survey that thought to translate it into Spanish. Um, for our staff um, to be able to, to give their perspectives as it related to the climate survey. So that's what intentional inclusion looks like. My question is to the panel, and I'm wanting to know, just uh, make believe that this is Fort Worth. It's very diverse. How would you go about getting them to understand that making Juneteenth a national holiday <laughs> would be a unifier. This ain't got nothing to do with statistics and all that stuff. I need to know what would you do to get them to sign a petition, we need 100,000 signatures, and you don't have but one month to do it. How would you go about getting your city to participate. Uh, I, I think for me, you know, I, I celebrate Juneteenth every year. It's, it's, it's a tradition that I've been doing since as far back as I can remember. But I think uh, public service announcements, social media, mass melons, we put a lot of things we don't care about in our water bills so we can include uh, sign up sheets and try to get encouraged uh, people to sign up to sign a petition. But I think Fort Worth is a city that's made up of a lot of different cultures, you know, uh, 
We're, we take pride in being Cowtown in the stockyards. We should take pride in our Hispanic heritage. We should take pride in our Juneteenth and other African-American holidays. So I think just having everyone buy in and let's just let's get to it. But, you know, we can only do so much on the sidelines. We have to get in the game and play. I would just state, especially uh, since the city of Fort Worth is so very diverse, we all need to understand is Latinx history, that's my history too if I'm a part of Texas. Juneteenth, that's a part of, <laughs> that's a part of, um, of our collective history too. Resettlement of, of immigration, that's what makes all of us a community. So some education on um, that shared history that we have and lifting that up and celebrating it, giving it space to be celebrated as well as a community, I think is important. It can be a real unifier. Um, my name is Teresita Hurtado Ramos, and I've only been a resident for two years at Fort Worth. My question is, what training strategy, strategies do you use to get the diversity, equity, and inclusion message across especially to the resistant and disruptive participants that are required to be there. So I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, that is the foundation of what uh, we do at UNT. It's the foundation of what we did at TCC. Um, sometimes we have had to train folks that have to get trained because something had happened. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, they clearly need some development. Um, but what we do is, again, it's cultural humility. Look yourself in the mirror. Consider what your own biases and perspectives are. Consider things like privilege and equity and access and inclusion and think about how that is related to the policies, programs, and practices within your respective areas, and use your spheres of influence to do something. Quickly, uh, I would, I, oh, oh. I, I would echo that too. I'll just go really quickly, Stephen. That some education about what diversity and inclusion is not. Equity for everyone else doesn't mean less rights for you or less equity for you. It's not a pie. <laughs> as the saying goes. And so some explanation about what diversity and inclusion is not and the benefits that come from, from that as a community I think is very, is very important. Again, recognizing things like bias, implicit bias, whether it be selection, whether it be home loans, whether it be a loan to start businesses, all of those things are important. Those microaggressions and how, that, how those things permeate our systems. So, Taking a look at first what diversity and inclusion is not would be a good starting point and meeting people where they are at. And, and I, would, quickly, I would uh, add to that, if you don't mind. Sure, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I would add to that in that, you know, there is a, a need to normalize the conversation around race. Um, I think that's important. I think that people need to be able to understand um, what behaviors actually coordinate and parallel with equity and inclusion and what that looks like and painting that picture of a, for individuals as well. So painting a clear picture around the behaviors and what those look like for individuals I think is key too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bring up the next question there. Uh, kind of balance it. So Christine, want to hear your voice too? Uh, the others? If I can keep okay, this is a question that I have. First of all, I've been, I'm Larry Johnson. I've been in Fort Worth all my life. First of all, the, the problem is we have poor leadership in the city. That's number one. So now I want you to tell me how you can come in here and think you're going to make a change when all these people before you haven't did it. So I'd like to answer that if you don't mind. Um, I feel that, and this is my personal stance, that it's a collective effort. It's not just me coming in changing. It's a collective effort. And it has to be me working with you, Larry, 
you working with me and us working together because that's the only way change will happen at the end of the day. Um, one person can't move a mountain by himself, right? And so I think that one of the things that I've seen within Fort Worth is the ability to collect and coordinate and pull together. I just want to see us working all toward the same goal, you know? And if it makes better, uh, a better Fort Worth, a better city, then let's do that. Yeah, sure. I have to, to echo that, that it's this diversity and inclusion work um, can't rest on one person's shoulders. And if um, you're concerned about city leadership, then that's an opportunity for you to become leadership. And leadership doesn't always have to have a title. Sometimes the most effective leaders are the ones that lead from the back of the room with no title at all. And you know, I, 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 I just oh, I'm sorry. Activist in the city, you know, I'm an activist, so you know, like to say it. And you know, if I if I may add on uh, just briefly, you know, you you ask what makes us think that we can, you know, change everything when the current leadership structure in place hasn't moved the needle forward. Well, you know, I, I believe I'm naive to believe that I can be the person to make change happen. Um, every opportunity I have to, to serve, there has been change that has followed soon, soon shortly thereafter. And I, I truly believe I'm a change agent and, if, and I, need, I need you to work with me if I'm in this role. I need everyone in this room to work with me. I don't need us just to come together when there's tragedy. I need us to come together when there's the good times, the bad times, and indifference. So that's how I believe that we can make a difference here. Uh, I just wanted to add just one final comment. You talked about leadership. I'm a firm believer that managers do things right, but leaders do the right thing. I would come in and make sure that all the leadership team at the city of Fort Worth is doing the right thing. Another thing, managers do things better. Leaders do better things. So we've got to figure out whether what we're doing is the right thing to do, period. And let's focus on what will actually advance the ball and really make a difference, uh, as you say, Mr. Young. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Cleveland Harris. The question that I'm going to ask you is in education. The scales don't weight the same when we talk about law. When we talk about law, we're talking about the lawyers know, the judges know, the police know, but the common everyday citizen doesn't know. There's a program called Know Your Rights, started up in Philadelphia. Now this program, which would be funded by the CCPD, would educate our children under constitutional law local law, and uh, state law. My question to you, with the education system in Fort Worth, Texas, being the lowest in the state of Texas, because you're dealing with racism, so my, I'm wondering is, how do you fit in in pushing with it, know your rights in the school system? If, if I may chime in, uh you know, I'm, I'm active in our school system. I'm on the advisory board for the Young Men's Leadership Academy. I devote my time and my That's attention. That's one entity. Okay, uh, okay and, and if I could continue, um, you know, I, I've gone into churches, Rising Star, where I've taught classes of knowing your Those rights. Bootleg churches. Okay. <laughs> well, well, if I, if, if I may... If you tell me where I need to be to teach this, that's where I would go. They've been out here for the longest, but they're not paying attention. I, but I, I haven't been out here, so if you give me an opportunity. You've been to Reverend Bell's church. I, and, and I, I haven't finished been. Cleveland. I mean, that's where you need to be. But see, you can't, it's plantation psychosis, what our people is going through. So we, I'm asking a straight up question. I don't want a hy hy hypothetical answer. I just want a straight up question about the systemic racism that we're dealing with in the Fort Worth school system. So I will tell you that, um, and Sean is, or she was in the audience, she was the formal, uh, former racial equity leader in Fort Worth ISD, right? 
I'm sorry. That was built off three brothers right. in this community. Me, one of them, and this brother behind me. Well, thank you for that. I can tell you that, I can tell you that I have personally gone in and worked with Fort Worth ISD and done equity training in Fort Worth ISD so you got and the worked flow with show. individuals. I'm sorry? You have received the flow show. You just got a scenery. See, these things, we've got to be beyond because the same things keep happening over and over again. They make a show, they take people's ideals, and when they take the ideals, then they stand up and get the awards. So my question is, what are you going to bring to the table that is going to be totally different from all of that than what we have been getting? Because, like, again, I say it's systemic racism in the school system. Yeah. Okay, let's see if we can focus on that on Cleveland's last question. What are you going to bring that's different given what has been? What I would say when you talk about the table, and a lot of times we talk about giving people places at the table, sometimes we have to bring the table to people, right? And, and have to make sure that there is a seat left at the table that allows folks to sit down and have a voice. Now, I'm not in Fort Worth. I, I don't know the history that you're speaking of, but a system will do what it's designed to do. Oh, no, no, and no. It, and it, and and if you, but what I'm, but what I'm saying is to let, disrupt. Let, let, let her answer. To let disrupt her. a system, one must acknowledge that it needs disruption and that it's broken. So I think that's the, the first step is just acknowledging that it's broken and doing something different. Clearly, things have not worked as they have worked before. You bring the table to the community and let the community tell us what it is we need to do so it's not paternalistic it's is it on, is it on? Okay. but I would go on to add to that I believe that Fort Worth ISD is working to disrupt the the racism within the school system I would I would say that all right I thank would you. say that they are thank you thank you Cleveland next yeah. as y'all know y'all ain't seen me all over America Y'all know my attitude. Problem is your attitude. I'm going to say again, we come back with the same Jim Crow conversations that my father then went through. It's 2019. We are too apologetic for those who stab us in the back, give us a knife, and make us feel guilty, and then tell us to forgive them. It's time out for that. The day of the cow towel stepping and fetching, I don't care if you belong to the boule, I don't care. I see you. I know you. That's your problem. It's your attitude. You can't play them games no more. I got children to raise. So what is your revolution? Well, people ask myself, I got to raise children and tired of this monster in the room. It has taken a vow to destroy my people, and they're doing it every day. Look at this school system. No grocery stores in our communities. And you want to use the word diversity. Don't put my people as a minus no more, sister. We are part of a human race, the beginning of a human race. We are people of Aboriginal and African descent. When you put that word minority, you're talking about right women to me. So don't use that word. We are people of African descent. We need to be acknowledged as part of this human race, not a minority. That's a game. That's a trick bag. So I want to get rid of this plague, this virus, this plague. What is your plan for this Afro-American agenda that needs to be laid down in Fort Worth? We don't need to be sitting at our table. We need to get our own table. Understand? So what is your answer and your solution to this issue that we've been plaguing this, in this city? All right. Who wants to take that? <laughs> If, I, if I'm understanding your, your question correctly, you're asking what we will do to change a system that you haven't seen change in after years and years of it. Is, is that accurate? Ma'am, my daddy's going to be 80 years old. So that tells you my age. Things went through a whole bunch, so I won't have to deal with this. My grandma was alive 
when Jesse Washington got did the way he did in, in uh, Waco, Texas. And I still see the same things going on. The systemic lynching of people of African descent. We are the most hated people on the face of the planet Earth. Our young men are missing. Organ stealing, sex trafficking, organ stealing. And you sit there and tell me to embrace some individuals that have done nothing but degradation. And you tell me to be diverse, sister. If you don't have a plan, go back and reassess yourselves. Because fear and God don't belong in the same place. And so, therefore, if you don't have an answer, just say, brother, I need to re 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 reassess it. We ain't playing that game no more. My evolution is my revolution. I got all my power to the people. So if you can't roll Thank like you. us, we're going to roll right over you. So if you don't come with this type of plan, because my dad went through too much. We know better. And the playbook is there, and y'all know. Whether it came from Megan, Martin, Malcolm, Adam Clayton Powell, y'all know. So it's no excuse. What got you stifled is because you are scared. Can I ask you a question? Well, can I ask I could, a question? Could, wait a minute. What? what? Wait a minute. So you're, you're, you're responding, so finish and then respond. Okay. Thank you. I, I think he's laid the, the question out pretty good. So your response. So my re response is before you can love somebody else, you have to love yourself. You have to love yourself. And when you love yourself, you're going to do things differently. If the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result, we have to do things differently. And that means love. Hate does not, hate doesn't work, it escalates. Love is the only thing. Love is the only thing that can multiply. And when you begin to love yourself first, then you can start to look at other people with respect. Oh, ho hold on. Did someone else wanted to respond as well to, to the question? I'm, I'm going to decline. Anyone else? I'm going to decline. Yes. Good evening. My name is Ebony Rose. I use she, her, her pronouns. I am a resident of District 3, and my question is for the entire panel. In light of the current climate in our city, especially as it relates to citizens of color being victimized by the city officials and staff sworn to protect them, I would like to know if any of the candidates for this position are familiar with the concept of restorative justice, and if so, have any insights on how the tenets of this approach to community healing might be utilized in our city? That's exactly okay. the question that I was trying to answer earlier. Um, one of the programs that were implemented in South Bend after the uh, Eric Logan's death um, at the hands of a police officer is Trauma-Informed Community and Restorative Justice, um, which is a program that encompasses um, several different areas, not just education, but also economic development, housing, transportation, um, and it starts in the neighborhood. And it's centered around mental wellness. Um, and mental wellness in the community, in the neighborhoods, and making sure that uh, people in the, in the city of South Bend have access to resources um, because it's, it's tied to everything. And so we're in the process of becoming a trauma-informed community and underneath that umbrella is restorative justice. We've used that on the University of Nebraska campus too. I know I uh, mentioned earlier, you know, shortly after election, um, we had uh, quite a bit of discord across campus, and particularly after the anti-immigration uh, bills came out uh, legislatively and had students um, saying to each other, displaying behavior that wasn't part of the environment that we wanted to create at University of Nebraska. Uh, so sitting down with those students and having those conversations and really sometimes what it comes down to working across these issues are being able to disagree civilly and having some shared outcome as well. So I am familiar with the concept and we have used that across campus too, but particularly um, as it relates to some of our DACA students, immigrant students, and having conversations around the impact on that individual and, as, and that community when that behavior is in place. 
8, 9, 10, 11 is in the house. Come on up so we can see who's ready. I am number 9. Number 9, so 10, 11, 12. First of all, let me welcome y'all and say thank you for coming out. I want to thank the public for coming out in the community. My question, I was going to leave my question for just one person. But I feel like it's a panel question. Let me tell you, I'm a father of a 10-year-old black male. What would be the first thing, hear me, the first thing that you implement to ensure that my son and I are safe on the streets of Fort Worth, Texas. And for your answer, write it down a few registers. Look around, you look in the room, look who's in the room. Don't talk way up here. Write it down so some of these people can understand what you're saying. I'm from the heart, please. Mm -hmm. Don't politic me, don't, uh, Webster the dictionary me to death. <laughs> okay. let, let, let me start here. Uh, I've worked with the Black Police Officers Association in their street law program. So I, you I've, have no faith in the Black Police Officers Association in the city of Fort Worth, Texas. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, but but the, the, the bottom line is street law needs to be proliferated throughout the city to educate our brothers on how to conduct themselves. When, when there were a rash of police shootings of unarmed African-American males, our slogan was, don't, don't resist, submit, stay alive. So we don't, want, we don't want you to litigate on the street because you'll be dead. We want you to, we want you to litigate after you go home alive. I'm a lawyer, I can give you the law later on, but don't try to litigate on the street with the police officers because that's a recipe for disaster. The, the other thing I can say is, it starts at home. We as parents have to educate our young men what to do when they're in the car, what to do, how, where to have their license and registration, how to talk, to do everything they can. I know that that doesn't still keep some people alive. I'm saying that there is a menu of things, there's no panacea, and we've all got to figure this out together. Thank you. Is, was there another respondent to that question? Yes. I have two sons. Uh, one is incarcerated, and one is in college. And so I grew up having those same I, I, I grew up having those, my husband and I had those conversations with both of them because at the end of the day, I wanted them to come home and I wanted them to come home alive. But if you're asking me as a practitioner what I would implement um, here in the city of South Bend, it's going to take Fort Worth. Uh, Fort Worth. I'm sorry. Um, um, is making sure that we are educating the law enforcement officers here on how to engage human beings mm -hmm. and not just people of color mm -hmm. and having them understand that just as much as it's life or death that they feel, we feel that too. And so that's why I had mentioned that we have to humanize each other and understand at the end of the day, everybody just wants to go home. They want to eat dinner with their family. And you want to be free to raise your children. And so that would be my first priority, is making sure that that takes place and that education takes place here in Fort Worth. Thank you. And Shani, and yeah, then we'll I, go to the next question. What I would say is I would flip it. And while we know the reality of the fact that things are different for black males, what I would flip it and do is say, how about we start with um, police officers um, engaging in mentoring programs where they're actively mentoring and getting to know young black males so they see them as children I first? I already have that police athletic league. Okay, and, and so that 
that would help to humanize so that before you look at a child as a potential um, criminal, which is sometimes what is done, that you are reminded that that person is somebody's son. Could be your son if they were just born with a little bit more melanin uh, than, than yours. Thank you. The last question. Just one question per person. Yeah, that was a great I usually, question. I usually conduct myself a little better than this. Thank you. I need to explain something to Mr. Francis. Yeah. It's going to take 10 seconds, please. 10 Mr. seconds. Francis. 10 yes, seconds. Sir. You talk about how we're supposed to conduct ourselves sitting in the car driving when we get pulled over. But how do you conduct yourself when you're sitting in the privacy of your own home and a police officer doesn't knock on the door, comes around the side of the house, and shoots you through the window? of your home in front of an eight-year-old child. Tell me how do you teach your sons to react to that, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next. Next. Thank you. My name is Benson Varghese. I'm a criminal defense attorney here in Fort Worth. The audience is clapping because they understand that in no arena besides the criminal justice system do the issues of racial injustice come to the forefront. So my question is to you, Mr. Stimson, how do you, um, as a prosecutor, as someone who lives in Fort Worth, how are you currently listening to the voices in Fort Worth that will enable you to hit the ground running to implement change if you got this position? I, I think exactly kind of what you said is that I, I'm, I'm in the community, I'm already listening, I'll continue to listen. and. Um, I, I think one of the big reasons that interests me in this position is um, I continue I could continue to be outside the city hall and uh, not not use my voice but I decided that it's, it's time for me to not sit on my hands and use my talents and, and use the the access that I have to actually change policy up if, if you know anything about me as a prosecutor you know that I just don't look at a, a case file by a case number but I look at the person you know uh, uh, being a black male and be growing up in the community I grew up in a lot of people end up on the other side of the table it's the reason why I wanted to be a prosecutor so someone's uh, family knows that they're not just getting judged because of the crime that they did did but they're also getting viewed as the person that they are and just knowing that prisons isn't how you go about rehabilitating someone but there's other avenues and so as this role as a diversity and inclusion director the same approach that I use as being a prosecutor would be the same approach as let's look at the bigger picture and let's see how we can resolve this for for works for everyone and not just for benefiting one party thank you reason why I'm not the only criminal defense attorney in the room here to support you. Thank you. Next question. We're, we're wrapping it up now. Good evening. My name is Kathy McKee. I'm from the east side of Fort Worth. My question is, if you're, this committee is going to be elected, whoever's going to be elected to make this committee, how do we know as citizens in lower incomes, whether it be black, Hispanics, what they consider middle, middle income communities, won't be silenced by the white money that runs the city of Fort Worth? Just my question. The question was, in a low income that consists of black and Hispanics, can y'all hear me now? Okay. In a community where there are blacks and Hispanics, which is considered low income majority of the time, how can this committee assure us that the white money that runs this, the city of Fort Worth won't hush you and contain you and then silence our voice like they've always done? Thank you. Thank you. If, 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 if I may answer that question, um, uh, if, if the way you phrase it, white money, white money has never made me who the person I am. I, I grew up on, on, on public assistance, so I know what it's like to grow up and, and be in a community t and growing up without with limited resources. And so um, as I've elevated myself with education, I want to give back to the communities where I grew up in, where the people who aren't fortunate enough for the same opportunities that I have know that they, they too, their kids can have the same opportunities. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not a person that can be uh, a silence by influence of power because I, you know, being an attorney, I know my bar card works anywhere in the state of Texas. So if it doesn't work out with the city, I'm going to go back to my house in Fort Worth and continue to do what I was doing in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, the next, next question. 
Okay, um, my name is Kathy Hall, and I grew up on the east side too, proud graduate of Poly High School. Um, our population, the 54% of the population here in Fort Worth is Latino and black. And in, light of, in the shadow of a Tatiana Jefferson, who was shot and killed in her house, and SB4, and 287G, I would like to gear this question to Ms. Jenkins and Ms. Moore. Can you give us some of the best practices for working with a police department to initiate real change working with those populations? Mm -hmm. yes. I would say first, the representation of the police force needs to change. In addition to um, some training or development that needs to happen within the police force. The first time um, that those uh, officers that are actually there to serve and protect interact with the community shouldn't be a policing situation. Um, and so I think a lot of that, when you're able to change representation within the department, I think that that would be, that that's the start of some real change. Who is actually um, leading those departments um, who is matriculating up into uh, roles of captains, sergeants, all of those things need to be taken into consideration to change the narrative and change and bring those perspectives that are absent into the force and then change that interaction with the community. And I just go back to bias awareness. To me, that is ground zero for um, any kind of change. Whenever I do any kind of bias awareness training, I have folks take the implicit association test. There's a weapons test that you can take that um, shows you how much maybe you associate people of color or not with, with weapons. And it's a pretty accurate test. Um, when I talk about bias awareness, I show my, my own biases and say diversity lady has biases. So if we could acknowledge that we have biases and that it is going to impact how we interact with each other, that's a start. That, that's how I've seen people's perspectives open, you know, as you know, some folks say, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. I mean, so sometimes you just have to be out of denial about you know, what lies beneath. Thank you. My name is Arch Mayfield, I'm an educator. Uh, first of all, thank you all for your interest in this job uh, particular, and for taking on the task, uh, particularly for the out-of-staters. If you're still in town tomorrow night, I invite you all to come to City Council uh, for another, <laughs> uh, another uh, take on what's going on. Uh, some of you are there pretty frequently. Uh, my question has a little bit of uh, piggybacking on uh, Ms. McKee's. Uh, there's a perception that the city leadership influencers, significant city, influ uh, city, city leadership influencers, if not city government, is not yet convinced that we need this position. How would you work behind the scenes? Most of you talked a lot tonight about how you would work with the citizens and city government. How would you work behind the scenes with city leadership influencers to uh, address that, that skepticism? Anyone. Well, I, Stephen, you, you can't work behind the scenes. This, this is a transparent, upfront, in-your-face issue. And at the city of Columbus, the mayor used to say, we want to have an outside-in approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We start from the outskirts of the city and organ corporations, nonprofits, community-based organizations have to get on board with a baseline standard of cultural competency, equity, et cetera, proficiency. And they close in on everybody who's not on board until they cause them to either leave if they're not on board or, or relocate. So, so either you're with us or you're not. That's business, that's civic, that's academia, that's law enforcement. So it's a common approach that's united in solidarity that says, Fort Worth is not that kind of place. If you think it's that kind of place, this is not the place for you to live. So it has to be intentional. It has to be uh, uh, inclusive and comprehensive. One of the things that um, I've been able to do, um, which is in large part why it never makes the news, is because uh, I build relationships with people 
um, and I don't do it because uh, I want it on the front page of the newspaper or that I want uh, it to be on CNN. And um, in order for those, Jesus Christ. Uh, so I think, I think um, a large part of what you, what you haven't seen about the city of South Bend um, since uh, the, what made CNN and MSNBC is that those people that were uh, voicing their frustrations on national television are now working side by side with us to fix the issues. And we did that by having conversations in my office um, and at the local coffee shop. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Eva Sandoval Bonilla, and I am the chair of the Human Relations Commission for the City of Fort Worth. I'm sorry I didn't make the reception, but work gets in the way. Diversity costs money. I like that. Yet, the commissioners and many of the citizens in Fort Worth feel discounted. We are powerless. The Human Relations Commission meets the first Monday of every month, but we are not important enough for a city manager or an assistant city manager to attend our meetings. The citizens come and present their problems, yet we, uh, we and, and organizations and we as the commissioners vote and make recommendations and we make gorgeous recommendations Word, word it correctly, and we turn these recommendations to the city council and the mayor, and of course, the city manager, but they don't even have to acknowledge it. And we, many times we ask our direct, well, our assistant director, Angela Rush, who y'all have met, have you heard anything about the recommendations we made? And she says, no, nope, not yet. We never get a response. And so, I want to know, what do you think about that policy and what do you think needs to be changed? Mm -hmm. I'll speak nope. on that, I'll sp if you will. Um, earlier, we had a reception and, um, at another location. And you know, one of the things that um, we talked about is whose voice is missing out of the room, right? And who is not being heard. Um, and Quite honestly, I've been to city council meetings. I've seen, you know, the demands, and I've seen um, everyone's frustration around what's going on. And to be honest with you, I'm frustrated. You know, as a black female, you know, I don't like the fact that citizens and residents don't feel safe, you know. And I want to feel safe in my city just like you. Um, and one of the things that I think that is important to, um, to bring to the forefront is that if you've got great recommendations and you've got changes that can be initiated to make the city better, those need to be heard. They need to be listened to. They need to be taken into consideration just like anyone else. And so I say to you, you know, those voices are important and they do need to be heard. Um, regardless of who it is, you know. Um, and so my job would be to hear those voices and hear what's being said and recognize that those things and those problems that are being addressed and being um, listed tonight and said tonight, that some change comes out of that. Three questions, three minutes. <laughs> That's a, a minute a question, not three minutes a question. Okay. I'm wanting you to know that if anybody has had problems with police, I have. But there are young policemen who, during Juneteenth, took it upon themselves to mentor the young fellas over at uh, O.D. Wide High School, sent them to Las Vegas for the finals and all. They called it Opal's Hoopteenth. As a, but I've had problems like you've never heard before. In 39, 
my home was bombed and we lost everything because we had moved into a white neighborhood. But I guarantee you, every policeman on this force is not like those people were then. You need to know that. Thank you, Opal. Ms. Opal. Yes. Hello. My name is Celeste Dukes. Uh, I let my dinner get cold coming up here to talk and listen to y'all. And uh, I ain't really heard nothing uh, substantial yet. I mean, that what brought me here. Uh, First of all, the city of Fort Worth ain't gonna do nothing that, that, that they don't have to do. You understand what I'm saying? And you have the, it's like the city, when some jump off, it's like they like, let's play for it, like a game of chess. And the, the citizens of Fort Worth uh, would, uh, are forced into a game of chess only with a check of skill set. You understand what I'm saying? And so they gave us this one piece, but this one piece that they gave us is not equal in value to the piece that they took. And I want everybody to understand that. So we done jumped and moved on to the next thing. I want to know, get back to that thing, to what, what we gonna do about that thing before we move on to the next one. What, what's, what's that thing? The issue, the issue that bothers, sir. Tatiana. Say that again. Tatiana. Tatiana. Mm. Tatiana. See, and I've do? always been able to go to the police department and I've always been able to go to the police department so, and to, uh, I've always been able to go to the police department and let a complaint, never to be heard from again. They don't get back to me. Right. What they done did now is created a buffer. I can't even go to them no more. And we're gonna blame it on y'all. Mm. Y'all just a buffer, a go between. So how do we stop that from ever happening again? Hold the paper up. That's the question, I tell Anna Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What role mm -hmm. do you see yourself playing making sure that that doesn't happen? Uh, you know, for, for, for me, it, it one, uh, I have to send my condolences, obviously, to the Atiana Jefferson's family um, um, for the tragedy that did happen to her. And how would I go about preventing something like that for happening again to anyone in Fort Worth but anywhere? Um, I, I think I have to use my background and my experience to where um, I just can't uh, lose my criminal justice background by coming to the city to where whomever ultimately is a part of the who becomes the police monitor or who becomes on the citizens review board, I have to work hand in hand to one, not only educate the public of the procedures and the laws that are in place, but also the individuals that are gonna be in place to, uh, to help restore that trust because there's not trust right now. No one within the city feels trust uh, uh, for the PD. And so how do we, how do we fix that? I don't and, and like y'all saying that y'all have these meetings where we have all these get together, uh, getting us together with a bunch of police officers having clumps of TA is gonna make us buddies. Right. And that's, that's not going to work. No, I absolutely agree. Right. You know, it, it, can't, it can't be lip service. It actually has to be tangible results. And so, you know, if that means going back into the training of how our new officers are being trained, then that's what we need to do. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion, I think we're past the point to where we need to teach our black, black sons how to interact with police officers. Why can't police officers know how to interact with our communities? And so we need to work with uh, uh, trying to figure out some type of peace to, to, to assist police officers in their duties, but also keep our, our community safe. For our last community question, does anyone else want to weigh in on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I think in addition to, uh, well, I don't know the facts and the investigation is not done, but I believe there was not <laughs> They didn't, they didn't follow procedures, okay? So if that's true, we got to make sure that those procedures are followed in the, in the future. Among that, in addition to that, there's training and all those other things. So there's not just one issue. The investigation has to thoroughly be conducted to make sure that whatever procedures weren't followed are put on the front page so that it doesn't happen again. And every single officer has to be aware of those types of procedures and the, the, the requirement to follow them to the T. Mm -hmm. Last question. Uh, Angie Crawford, uh, resident of Fort Worth, um, particularly to Ms. Moore and Ms. Jenkins. Um, I hear many references tonight about you working with us, all the candidates, um, the residents um, will move the needle. I think we can hear, we're ready. Um, the barrier this, uh, this progress has is especially in acknowledging bias and ri racism as the city government. Considering that this very city government will be your employer, what skill set do you bring to the table to work with those who do not embrace diversity and inclusion in city government? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and since you posted it to us, um, I've said this a couple of times today that I think one of the things that I bring to this, and, and I've been told this by a number of different people from a number of different perspectives and backgrounds, is that I really invite people to look at themselves. I think that's the first part, is when you hold a mirror up to folks and give them an opportunity to look at themselves think about how their own perspectives and experiences, limited perspectives. Sometimes we live in a bubble, and we don't know that we're in a bubble until we realize we're looking around and we're the only one in the bubble, right? So it's having that skill of bringing people to the table just by looking at yourself and then developing some bridging capital among colleagues initially within the city so that we're all on the same page and we can realize that through that perspective taking, we need to now look at the perspectives of the people in this room, right? In addition to being em employees of the city, looking at the perspectives of the people in this room so we can develop some, some bridging capital. And you have to build, you have to build would, authentic, oh. oh. That's, yeah. I would say by continuing to have those dialogues and asking the hard questions sometimes, how's what you've been doing been working out for you? And where do you want the city of Fort Worth to be headed? And at some point, the rubber meets the road. I know you talked about the outside in. At some point, maybe this isn't the place for you. And I know someone mentioned earlier too, not becoming part of the system. I mean, each of us here on this panel, we're here to, because we see the opportunity to come here and affect change positively. And so um, that whole issue of panhandling or um, being someone else's mouthpiece, that's not what we're here for and we haven't committed 17 plus years, 20 plus years doing this work to do that. But those ongoing dialogues and conversation around that shared goal, I think is gonna be critically important. And sometimes you have to meet people where they are. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Sometimes you know and you don't wanna do better. And that's a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very brief. <laughs> you have to build authentic relationships with people before you can tell them the truth and before they will receive it. And so when you talk about how you'll move the needle if you don't have an established relationship with somebody and you try to tell them, here's who you are, it's gonna fall on deaf ears. So you have to establish a real relationship. And that goes for both the community and with law enforcement. And when that happens, then you can communicate and, and put a mirror up and make sure that they're self-aware. If we're courteous and adjourn in a way that doesn't knock anybody down, we have just enough time to uh, dismiss ourselves after Maddie's very brief question. Thank you, Esther. We, it's very clear that the urgency of a response has to do with those very first criminal justice recommendations, but there are more than 20 recommendations having to do with so many other things that impact the lives of, of people here in Fort Worth, education and transportation and housing. And I want to know who it is your understanding will set the priorities of what you will deal with after you deal with that number one priority, which is the criminal justice one, which has this, this whole city up in arms. I need to know what, other, what are your priorities after that, and who do you believe sets your agenda for those priorities? Well, I, I, I ask that you be very brief. Great question. Keep it under 60 seconds, but I, very brief. I think that uh, in developing an equity plan for Fort Worth, external community stakeholders, leaders, you know, United Fort Worth, whoever wants to be involved needs to be at the table, along with internal City of Fort Worth stakeholders, those key departments that have the resources and authority to make change. So it's a collaborative effort that would sit down and set the priorities for the plan. Thank you, Stephen. Chip. The second priority has to be um, addressing poverty. When people can't pay
pay their electric bill and they can't make rent and they can't buy food, get angry. And so if we're not addressing the economic development, the inclusive economic development of a community, uh, then everything else is, is pointless. And so that has to be second priority. Please, please listen to Michonne as he gets, she gives her. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, for me, it would be health. Um, I think that when you think about the social determinants of health and how that impacts uh, communities, um, particular communities of color and the disparities that are there, uh, I think the health initiatives are very important and needed, um, whether that is putting some policies in place that will help to eliminate um, food deserts and um, to help to ensure that people have equal access in different, in different areas of the town, no matter what that looks like, I think is important. Um, so health is very important for me. Please join with me in applauding our six candidates. And last but not least, join with me in applauding our outstanding, courageous, clear-minded, powerful questions of our community. We are adjourned.